Ninety years ago, our longest-serving monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, was born. Since then, millions of us have met her, and many have got close. You're having a good old stare at the Queen, aren't you? Oh, yes, we are. I had a good view of her. But how well do we know her? And how well does she know us? She said to me that she doesn't feel properly dressed without her. This is Her Majesty as you've never seen her before. I was completely paralysed as this amazing icon walked over my gangway. A people's portrait of the Queen. She uh, is on our stamps and she's on our coins and she's in our hearts. How are you doing? In this series, Ainsley Harriet cooks up a coronation treat in London. Come on, let's wave together then, Ralph. <laughs> Welcome to my home. Thank you. You, my, like, you uh, like the Queen, don't you? <laughs> Alan Jones gets super close with a super fan in Wales. Look at that. It's practically this close. <laughs> and I'll be tracking down people who've met the Queen in a corner of Britain that has over 700 miles of stunning coastline. So the sea plays a really important part in people's lives here. And it also lies behind a powerful connection between this part of Britain and the Queen. My journey starts right here in the naval city of Portsmouth. Now, four generations of the Queen's family have gone to sea in Royal Navy ships, some of them from this very port. From here, I'll be hitting the road to get to the heart of the Queen's special relationship with the place I call home, the southwest of England. During 14 years as the BBC's royal correspondent, I was lucky enough to meet the Queen quite a few times. But she was nearly always on duty, and our conversations were pretty much small talk. So I'm hoping that by meeting people who've chatted with her in different situations, I might learn more about the extraordinary woman whose life I've shadowed. I think she's always very elegantly dressed. Yeah, good handbags. We've had the Queen here since the Diamond Jubilee back in 2012 here in the market. When you think she's 19, she's at her desk at whatever time it is in the morning. We've got a new one over here, which um, we've, just, we've just had in, and uh, she looks rather regal in this one. Happy 90th birthday. We think you do a great job. We always boast a big turnout for the Queen here in the southwest. We brought the entire Navy out to greet the new Queen in 1953. She launched her Golden Jubilee tour from Falmouth and almost launched her hat. Whether opening tin mines or blessing our biggest ships... May God bless her and all who sail in her. We always have a curtsy, bow or salute ready to greet her. And the Queen has a very personal link to the region. Her grandfather, her father, her husband and two of her children began their military careers here. And, of course, as head of the armed forces, she's a regular visitor to its many military bases. She's always taken her forces role extremely seriously, and never more so than back in April 1982, when Britain held its breath as we went to war with Argentina. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. Argentina had claimed the Falklands, a remote British territory 8,000 miles away in the southern Atlantic. A task force of 100 ships and 27,000 troops had to be scrambled. With one aim, getting those islands back. Aircraft carrier HMS Invincible set out from Portsmouth on April the 5th. On board, over a 1,000 servicemen, many facing the full horror of war for the first time. they were sailing into the unknown. But that's not the whole story. For the Queen, it couldn't have been more personal. One of those young men was her own flesh and blood, her middle son, Andrew. As head of the armed forces, she had a responsibility to all the thousands of British servicemen going to war. 
But at that moment, she was first and foremost a mother. Andrew, a naval helicopter pilot with Invincible, was keen to get stuck in for his mum, the Queen and country and insisted on frontline duties. As the task force headed south, the Queen faced weeks of uncertainty. And it wasn't long before Invincible was in the thick of the action. Its aircraft provided vital support for an intense battle on land. And I think you've got a, a picture of you in action, actually, in the fortress. That is yeah, me in the middle yeah. there, just about to go off leading uh, a, a patrol somewhere. That's my... Brigadier Johnny Rickett was commanding officer of the Welsh Guards. They suffered dreadful losses when HMS Sir Galahad was hit by Argentine aircraft. Johnny was already on shore when he heard his men had been attacked. I was up visiting uh, my forward company, and on the way up, suddenly um, two uh, aircraft came out very low. And we realized that they were enemy aircraft. Skyhawks 405 came low across the bay to bomb the two landing ships unloading men and supplies. One of the ships, Sir Galahad, burst into flames immediately. Within seconds, I was required on the radio, get yourself down to, to Fitzroy as quick as you can. You've got casualties in your battalion coming ashore from the Galahad. With the tears uh, almost running down my cheeks, then went back down to Fitzroy to greet the, the remnants of uh, my soldiers coming ashore. And from the shore, Johnny witnessed the full horror of the unfolding nightmare. The helicopters, which had been moving equipment forward, now flocked to help rescue survivors. On the cliff tops, medical staff waited for the helicopters to bring the casualties to them. It was a pretty horrific time because we were under attack from um, the Argentine Air Force at that particular time. And um, people were, were running around in, in, a, in a rather desperate state. In the middle of the airlift, another air raid was called, but the orderlies kept working, ignoring the crates of ammunition stacked in the grass around about. In the confusion, it took hours to find out who'd survived and who had not. 48 men were killed that day. 32 were from Johnny's battalion. So what are your feelings now, looking back on, on that day? Well, one utter, utter sadness, but the, the point which one has to do as, as, as a commander is to grip things and get people thinking forward rather than backwards. And I was determined from that moment the battalion wouldn't look backwards. We must get on. We had, still had a role to play. Johnny's troops went on to play a vital part in retaking Port Stanley and winning the war. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> so after the conflict, uh, unsurprisingly, you were honoured by the Queen, weren't you? Along with many others, I can assure you. Tell me about that, though. Well, it was, it was, it was very well special, it was tremendous. I mean, when, when I went in, the, the Queen, obviously, she talks to everybody who gets a decoration of some sort, but she seemed to spend a bit longer, uh, and she was very anxious uh, about the families. Specifically in the families affected by the Galahad? Yes. Um, yeah, she, she was anxious about, about people's feelings and, and worries and, and where they're still all, all right. Yeah. And um, so that, a very natural conversation. It was, it was wonderful. To be I, and did you feel it was absolutely genuine or she had been briefed that she... Not at all, no, no, not at all. No. I mean, you can see, look, look, look at her face, that's, that's genuine. <laughs> the general yeah. happy smile to be, to be amongst us. That's me, obviously. Yeah. And she loves her, her servicemen and women, as you know. So it's no surprise that the Queen was at the centre of an outpouring of love and pride when her son's ship, Invincible, returned to Portsmouth. She sailed out to board the carrier to welcome her son and the crew home. 
George Burkett was chief mechanic on board. He was coming home to his wife, Marie, and his teenage son. I think a lot of people will remember the day that uh, the task force came back here to, to Portsmouth. Uh, it must be seared on your memory. What was it like? By the time we came into Portsmouth, it was, uh, it was a lovely day. And there was uh, small ships, yachts of every size uh, escorting us in, and the, the tugs with the, uh, the coloured water come from the cannons. Uh, and thousands and thousands of people. You all, could see them and them, hear them, could crikey, you? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, that must amazing. have been so emotional. Oh, crikey, yeah, yeah definitely. After five months, it was party time in Portsmouth, with Marie one of thousands lining the quay, desperate to be reunited with loved ones. There's just thousands of people. It was just amazing with, with the um, placards and banners and all sorts waving around, and I had my own. Did you? Yes. <laughs> which said, welcome home, George. Really? And it had 143 on there, on the bottom, oh. which stands for I love you. The oh, one letter I in I, the four letters in love, and the three letters in I you. Didn't know that. Wow! Welcome home, George. You could see that from. Can oh, you see Craig, that? Yes, yeah, I did eventually. Yeah. Meanwhile, on board, Andrew was catching up with his mother and sharing his thoughts with the press. Oh, I think I've experienced something that, that uh, very few people are able to experience: loneliness um, when you lie down on the deck, and, and that moment when there are missiles and things flying around at that precise moment you are on your own and that's all that's all there is you must identify to some extent with with how the queen was feeling herself i mean you were sending your husband away and welcoming him home and for her it was her son i suspect she was extremely proud like we all were from the youngest to the oldest person on the ship all the relations that come to meet them which is so happy and excited and proud to be there Proud for her, though, really, because she can't really jump up and down and, you know, cheer, no, can she? She's got no, to be dignified, no, no, you know. No, true. That's, yeah, I, I'm sure inside she wanted to, but <laughs> she just couldn't. I bet. While the Queen was on board, no one could leave the ship. But when her visit ended, there was no holding them back. The Queen disembarked first, uh, rightly so. And uh, then they opened the gangways and they swooped down like. Eat sick and ferrets, I suppose, really. <laughs> so, what was it like on the, the first embrace back home? It's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was just lovely, the first kiss. I mean, it was just after, it was a long wait. It was worth it. It was just lovely. But um, I, I think George was more emotional than me. I was just yeah. absolutely beaming. Yeah. yeah. Is it still emotional today? Yeah, certainly when you think of, uh, you know, people you knew who, who didn't get back then, uh, that's always a bit of a grueler. Uh, same as all the other guys, First World War, Second World War, and all the other conflicts. I mean, we should never forget that, uh, you know. These people put it on the line for the country and the Queen, of course. Do you know, listening to George and Marie there really makes you think how difficult it must sometimes be for the Queen. It was such an emotional homecoming that day. And yet she had this dual role, head of the armed forces, having to be formal, carry out her duty. When in all honesty, she was probably feeling like every other mum. Just, thank goodness, my boys come home safe. I'm really lucky to live here in Devon because it's so beautiful, but I've also been very lucky to travel around the world with the Queen. I think you really have to be with her and travel with her 
to see how incredibly popular she is. The Queen has said she wants to meet as many people as possible on this tour, and there certainly seem to be thousands who want to see her. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the deserts, bare man. I breathe the mountain air, man. I travel, I've had my share, man. I've been everywhere. She's the world's most travelled monarch. I've been everywhere. The Buckingham Palace view of the tour so far is that it's been a spectacular success. And armed with my reporter's notebook and a fine selection of shoulder pads, I've shadowed her from India to Australia, Africa to Pakistan. Jenny Bond, BBC News, Islamabad. Back at my home in Devon... Hey, Fitz! Jenny. Friends like my old buddy and fellow broadcaster David Fitzgerald were always fascinated to find out whether I'd managed to catch a glimpse of the real woman behind the royal facade. Hey, come in. God, I've been looking through some of the bits and pieces I've collected over the years. I've got an attic full of them, I tell you. But um, that's, that's the kind of invitation you get when mm. um, you are invited to the palace or the castle. Have you had one? Yes, I have, yeah, just been the once, yeah. I never liked yeah. it to go again. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I think the first time that I did meet her at one of these receptions, I told her what I thought was a very funny story, because I always like to tell her a funny story or m make her laugh in some way. And so um, I said, oh, ma'am, I'm always out st standing outside your house um, chatting to the camera, and I think, I wonder if you're in there looking at saying, what is that woman talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think she enjoyed it, and I think... That this picture uh, here, yeah. um, in which I look like, like some ghastly pantomime dame thinking I'm hysterically funny, cheeks all pink, you know, oh, I'm meeting the Queen. <laughs> ghastly. <laughs> but look, I think she thinks I'm quite amusing. You also travelled with uh, Her Majesty, which I think that's brilliant. Where did, where did you get to? Oh, gosh, you know, we went round the world so many times I can hardly remember. But I think South Africa was really, really magical. We went there with the Queen in 95. Right. And it was... It was special for her as well. Escorted by a flotilla of small boats, Britannia sailed into Table Bay, bringing the Queen on one of the great state occasions of her reign. It was her first visit since 1947, when she had toured as a love-struck young princess.